Okay, so we are starting a brand new series this morning called Illuminate or Living in the Light of. It's in 1 John. So I want you to go this morning, if you have your Bibles or your devices, whatever you're watching us off of this morning, uh, I know some of you, like, you found a way to, to post that thing and get it up on the big screen and the TV, and thank God we don't have a 4K camera or HD because, good Lord, right? It's, it's, it's not pretty, but we'll, we're doing our best as we can. I told our, our media team this morning that we have, we have uh, asked the camera to do more than it is capable, and that is to make me look as good as possible, and it is maxed out, let me tell you, all right? If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn to 1 John, and you're going to go to chapter 1, and you're going you're gonna to hold in verse 5, okay? Just hold it there. We want to talk through some things first, okay? And then we're going to read all the way to, excuse me, it's 1 John chapter 5 through chapter 2, verse 6. So if you're, if you're writing things down, it's 1 John chap, chapter 1, 1 John 1, 5, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 through chapter 2, verse 6. I'll say that again because I messed it up just a second ago. It's 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, through chapter 2, verse 6. Now you go, wait, we're diving into two different chapters. Yes, because when we canonize Scripture, we added chapter and verse so we would know where to find it. But when you're reading John's letters, if you would, pull out the chapter and verse, and you get the original context of how he wrote this letter, okay? Now, he's writing these letters confronting really three, but we're only going to deal with two, three things that false teachers taught. And they were starting to come into the church, as is always how the enemy works, right? It starts to creep into the minds, hearts of believers about what Jesus really meant, because if he meant it the way he said it, then that means I have to live different. And everybody said amen. I see, I see you typing amen right now in the feed. <laughs> amen, right? Well, let me go back and say that again. If, if Jesus really meant it the way he said it, then I have to live different, Okay? So that you know I'm in the same boat with you, there are things that I read in Scripture that cause me to rethink <laughs> my behavior <laughs> in, a, in, a very, in a way that's, that's challenging. And I would love to tell you that it's this, you know, that, that all of a sudden the kitchen light goes dim and there's like a halo and a holy light that comes down upon me. Right, as I'm reading, and you hear angels singing in the background, and it's the revelation of, now this then is how you should live. And, I'm, and I go, yes, Lord. Yes, thank you, Father. Thank you for showing me. Thank you for correcting me. Thank you for fathering me into all truth. Okay? Now, I will tell you that up until recently, those moments are few and far between. Okay? And here's why. It's not because I don't thank God for fathering me and telling me and and really teaching me and guiding me and directing me into all truth, which, which by the way, that's a great way as we talk about confession today, that is a great way to start praying this. And we'll we'll get there, we'll get there. Um, I want you to know this morning that that's not normally how this goes, (laughs) all right? And I, I know, I know I'm not the only one that it doesn't go this way for. Amen. Okay, normally how this correction and discipline, it normally starts with a problem. And and sometimes the problem, are you with me? Just just do give the emoji, the head nod in the feed if you're with me, right? If you're, it starts with a problem and if you're with me, you know the problem is other people. Don't look at your spouse, don't look at the other people in your watch party. Just make eye contact with the dog. That's all you need to do this morning. Okay? Right? You just, the problem is never me. It's never you. It's never us. It is always other people. And other people have a way of showing me where, where I'm not necessarily the most right that I have ever been. 
Amen. Okay, if you're married, it's really important that you keep looking at the screen, right? And do not make eye contact with your spouse right now, right? Here's what I love, is that it never escaped Jesus that as we grow in Christ, we would need to know and understand how important it was what he accomplished at the cross, all right? So let me get back into a teaching that I did back in 2019 in in our Wednesday nights. We talked about living from the finished work of the cross. Amen. And we we even did a a much larger and in-depth kind of space-time continuum model, right, that Jesus living, that, that a lot of times believers, we live before he's on the cross, we live with him still on the cross, but very rarely do we ever graduate and mature to the place where what he did and accomplished on the cross is enough for us, okay? John, in his letters, that's where they're coming from. And he is very quick to remind the church, guys, we're living from the finished work. Amen. Okay? Living from the finished work of the cross. Let me adjust the microphone here. Living from the finished work of the cross, okay, means... I am living from a place of forgiveness. Amen. Okay? However, and I want to make this big but. There's a big but in the room, right? This is the big but. It requires me to still confess where I've missed the mark. Amen. Okay? It requires me to live in such a way that if I miss the mark is I'm going to read to you here in just a minute. If I miss the mark, that I know Jesus has already paid the price. And that if I'm faithful to confess to the Lord where I've missed the mark, He is faithful to forgive me for where I've missed the mark and cleanse me from all unrighteousness from having said miss the mark. Amen. Right? Some of you are going, where in the world is he? He is droning on about missing the mark. It's actually the Greek word hamartia, which means to miss the mark. It's, if you would, okay, it's an illustration used in the New Testament for sin, meaning having missed the bullseye. It's a shooting or an arrow type of analogy that the Greek uses, okay, to describe to us how sin helps us, or sin meaning we missed the mark. Okay, what's the bullseye? Ready? If we're missing the mark, then i got to know what the bullseye is, right? The bullseye is, go to, go to chapter 2, verse 6, okay? Chapter 2, verse 6 says this, For whoever claims to live in Jesus or live in Him, right, must walk as Jesus walked. Meaning, the mark is to walk as Jesus walked. To live as Jesus lived. Amen. Okay, so if I am missing the mark, then the mark that I'm aiming for is to walk as Jesus walked. Okay? Walk as Jesus walked. To think as Jesus thought or Jesus thinks. Okay? To love as Jesus loves. Right? To demonstrate compassion as Jesus would demonstrate compassion. Right? And you can start to fill in where, like, I I love this about the Word of God. Is that we're encouraged to to wake up and spend time with Him early in the morning. And to, to do an assessment, if you would about where, how's my walk? And then, and then we're to do this. We're to wait and listen. Are you ready? And be quiet. And let Him show us where we're falling short or we're missing the mark in our life. And, and I like to say it like this. I'm to think as Jesus thinks. I'm to feel as Jesus feels and I'm to act as Jesus acts. If I'll, if I'll just sum it up in those three ways, thoughts, feelings, actions, if I'll think like Jesus thinks, 
if I'll feel like Jesus feels, and if I'll act like Jesus acts, I'll walk as Jesus walked. Man, that was good. Now, we're not even into the paid stuff yet. You're still getting the freebies right now. Amen. If thou think as Jesus thinks, right? If thou act as Jesus acts, right? And if thou feel as Jesus feels, all right, I'm, I'm having a malfunction up here with the water bottle. Okay, I'll walk as Jesus walked. Let me say it one more time. If thou think like Jesus thinks, if thou feel like Jesus feels, if thou act like Jesus acts, then I will walk as Jesus walks. Amen. Most of us, most of us are in touch with the hardened sinner part of our lives. And, and to be honest with you, we are experts at sin from the day we came in to this world kicking and screaming. Okay? You with me? Right? Let's get into the word for just a second. John says in chapter 1, verse 5, I'm going to read it to you. This is the message we have heard from Jesus and declare to you, that God is light. In Him, there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with God, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, we have fellowship with, with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. Amen. Praise the Lord. Some of you got delivered right then and there. Okay? Here's the, here's the two things we got to deal with. If we claim to be without sin, okay? I'll explain that more in a minute. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, Jesus is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and purify us from all unrighteousness. Amen. Right? We've been quoting that thing since January 1. Okay? Verse 10. This is the other verse we got to deal with. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. How many of you went, uh, wait a minute, verse 8 and verse 10, as I look at these, they have a lot in common, they may even be the same verse, maybe where John reiterated in verse 10 what he meant in verse 8. How many of you have ever thought that or read that? Raise your hands, give me a thumbs up if you're watching. Okay, did you know, that, mind blown right here, two different verses two different things he's addressing let's bring some clarity amen to the word of god right sometimes when we read this thing i'll just i want to you know what i want to read this i have this as my clothes and i just want to read this to you now and i'm going to read it to you again when we get into the most trouble where i get into the most trouble trouble in my life in my relationship with my wife and kate okay where i get into the most trouble in my relationship with god here it is ready it's when I bring what sounds good and reasonable to my relationship with Him. It's when we bring the wisdom of man into a place where the fear of the Lord ne'er dwell. That's the, listen, there are places in our relationship with God that are meant for only the fear of the Lord. That's it. The wisdom of man has no place there. Amen. Amen. In, the, in, in my walk with God, what he calls sin, when he says, John, you missed the mark, I am not to apply the wisdom of man or compare, who am I talking to, or compare myself to others. I am to listen to the Lord and operate under this thing called the fear of the Lord. And did you know that in both Psalms and Proverbs, it says that it is the beginning of wisdom. You go, Pastor John, you just introduced this concept called the fear of the Lord, and we're not talking about fully what the fear of the Lord is. Yes, we're going to, but we're going to do it 
in, a, in an offshoot kind of way here. Now, over the next five weeks, we're going to be talking about the, the, the book of 1 John. We're going through John's letter, okay? Now, understand that with this, we have the way that the sermon calendar is divided up. We have a free week, or what we call a, a, a one-off, so to speak, a standalone, because one-off just sounds bad, right? We have a standalone, and in that standalone, the Lord wrote for me, the fear of the Lord. So what we're going to do, okay, is come into this thing. We're going to talk about 1 John. He's got five chapters. We have five weeks, right? What a coincidence the Holy Spirit has. And then at the end of this, we're going to encapsulate some things coming out of 1 John, going into a teaching, what exactly is the fear of the Lord and what place does it have in the life of the believer? Let me just tell you, if you're looking for wisdom, direction, guidance, okay, you need to do a word study on the fear of the Lord. Amen. Right? I'll tell you right now, Psalm 1, Proverbs 1. Go there. If, you, if all you do is get there is Psalm 1 and Proverbs 1 for the next couple weeks, you'll begin to understand a lot of what's written about the fear of the Lord. But we'll get into some deeper things later, okay? He, here is what I want us to know. When we get into the most trouble is when we bring what sounds good and reasonable into our relationship with God. Just because it's good doesn't mean it's God. Just because it's reasonable doesn't mean it's God. I don't know if you know this or not. There are many moments where God is not reasonable. Walking on water seems like an unreasonable thing to ask of humanity. And yet, in His Word, Jesus says, you'll do greater things than that, boys. Right? So you need to understand that yours is not a reasonable faith, right? It's a terrifying faith. It's a faith that stands up in the middle of a storm, gets out of the boat, and walks on water. How many of you know it wasn't the presence of fear, right? Listen, if you go back and read in Scripture, because now I'm like introducing this concept as well, yay me, right? You need to understand something. We don't have what is called a reasonable faith. That's a lie like from the left armpit of hell. There is nothing reasonable about putting your faith in a guy that supposedly has died on the cross, his shed blood covers sin, makes me righteous before a heavenly father, okay, and rose from the dead. You go, well, that's, that's the definition of Christianity. Did you know Christianity is not reasonable? Wait a minute. What? It seems to me like, Pastor John, you're unplugging for me reasons to be a Christian. When you should be plugging in the reasons I need to be a Christian, when you think about it from the place of your faith and my faith in Christ being reasonable, we lose. So never should we put the word reasonable in our faith because it's an unreasonable faith to begin with. Unless you are literally 2,000 or plus years old, and you saw Jesus take a beating, die on the cross, and were one of the 500 witnesses that, that he visited, having risen from the grave and ascending into heaven, it's an unreasonable faith. And if you are that old, you need to start attending 970 Church because I got questions. <laughs> Amen. Right? It's when we bring the wisdom of man into a place where the fear of the Lord should only dwell. When we get into the most trouble as believers, when we get into the most trouble as the church, when we get into the most trouble as parents and Christians and all of the above, it's when I bring before the Lord in my relationship with God the wisdom of man where only the fear of the Lord should dwell. Maybe we're struggling with sin. Let, let, not by show of hands, if you're staring at me right now, I'm going to assume we together probably struggling with the sin. Since all of you are staring at me, or most of you are staring at me, okay, what I'm going to assume is this. What am I going to do in the light of struggling with the sin? Is it, it's a thought, it's a feeling, it's an action. I want to unpack for you something this morning that is so profound, and it's not even in the main part of the notes. We're still in the free stuff, right? All Listen to me. Focus on me right now. 
all sin, all of the sin that we continue to struggle with and deal with is from a place where we have not let God heal. All sin, everything that you and I are tempted with and that we give into that temptation with is from a place we have not let God heal. Some of us have wounds from our past that we have not let God heal, and we are still walking around looking through the lens of the hurt and the offense, and therefore we are struggling, continuing to struggle and battle with the sin that the Bible says the shed blood of Jesus set us free from. Fair? Right? Amen if you're with me. If we'll, now listen to me. This goes real simple, right? Jesus has a one-step counseling ministry, right? One step towards him, and James 4, 8 says, if you draw near to the Lord, he will draw near to you. Wash your hands, right, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. There's a lot of times we go to the Lord in confession and repentance And because we so enjoy the heavy petting that we received, we continue to run back to that thing that He set us free from. Oh man, who am I preaching at? Right. Don't don't look at me with that tone of voice. Okay? I I see angry emojis being written right now. (laughs) All sin is coming from a place inside of my life. Everything that I'm struggling with, everything that I'm wrestling with, everything that, ne'er I say it, right, everything that is contending for my attention that is not from Him is 99.9% coming from a place where I have not let Him heal me, even though He has already intended because He's good and He could be nothing but good to heal me. Maybe you wrestle with trust. A lot of people wrestle with trust. I wrestle with trust. First off, my attention is on the distrust, okay? So my attention is automatically focused on the wrong thing. Moving forward with it, if I will let God come, right, and I'll bring him to my place that needs healing, right? And I'll leave him there. He'll begin to heal that place. Amen. Let us be counseled into truth that brings freedom. Come on. Listen, if we're being counseled that doesn't bring freedom, that's not counsel. That's heavy petting. We call that ministry. We repent right now. That is not ministry. Jesus does not need to go die on the cross again. One time did it. So if we know, it's secu- if we know that if it's secured and covered on his end, then why am I not walking in the truth and freedom on my end? He's perfect. I'm not. Where are we falling short? Okay, let's get into this for a second. Right, verse 8. We got to deal with verse 8. It's a different thing. Okay, verse 8. This is what John is confronting. It's the statement that's made and was creeping into the church that says, I'm not a sinner. Okay, now here's the thing. I want, I want to make sure that we understand this. Sin is an event. It is not our identity once we have said yes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen? Come on. All right. Sin is an event. It is not who I am once I've said yes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, what you're saying is, and what we're trying to do is, is we're saying that we live only from the identity of our worst day. And we walk around identifying with 
the sum of who we are based on our worst day. And Jesus died on the cross and therefore forgave our worst day. So then why are we living from a place where our worst day is our identity? It, right? Sin is an event. Once we've said yes to the Lord, well, wait a minute. What if I'm watching or what if I'm listening online and I haven't said yes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Well, the first thing I would tell you is this. Uh, you're, you're not technically a sinner so much as you're a slave to sin. <laughs> right? And that's biblical. You're in bondage to sin, number one. Number two, if you're within the sound of my voice and you haven't said yes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and you don't want to be a slave anymore, congratulations, today is your day. Now is the day of salvation. We'll give you a moment here in about 20 minutes or so where you can say yes to that thing and no, no longer be a slave to sin or to fear or to distrust, right? Amen. Okay, verse 8 says, I'm not a sinner, meaning it is the denial, listen to me, verse 8 is the denial of our sinful nature. John is having to confront some thoughts and some teachings that false teachers are bringing to the church, which means, right, I'm not a sinner. It is the, in other words, I'm denying that I, that I have or I was born of a sinful nature. All right, the counter to that, John doesn't necessarily go into that. Paul asserts it in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. I'm going to read it correctly, which means I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to quote it to you. I want to read it right. We're going there together. Go to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Okay? I'm going to start in verse 21. But now a righteousness from God, which is apart from the law has been made known or to which the law and the prophets testify. Be with, verse 22, just get with me. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. Amen. Then there's four words, really important. There is no difference. And then verse 23 starts in the middle of this statement. So let me just go back four words and start verse 23 right here, if you would. Just give me a little grace. There is no difference, comma, for all have sinned. And what? And fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 24, just because, and are justified freely by God's grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. All right, I got to stop because I'll preach Romans 3, 20. The rest of Romans 3 to you and not 1 John. Amen. Okay? Verse 8 deals with the statement, I'm not a sinner. Okay? Or, it, or you can write it like this, it is the denial that I have a sinful nature. For those of you who are struggling with this concept, we have a nursery ministry here at 970 Church. Okay? And, and I, once, once we are allowed to gather... Again, here in a building, okay, I would invite you to go downstairs, take five minutes out of your Sunday morning, let's say from 9.30 to 9.35, and during the nursery ministry, walk over to the zero to twos or whatever, threes, whatever they are, okay, all I know is I don't go in there, and go take a toy or a, or a nani, a binky, a nook, the pacifier thing, right, Go take that or a toy away from one of them. And you watch what happens. That is not of the Lord. I don't care who you are. <laughs> if you're going, you know, babies aren't really my thing and they just don't know better. Okay, no problem. Listen, go volunteer with Pastor Brittany or Pastor Kathy for 10 minutes. Take a seat. No, just literally like take a seat from a... a a toddler slash kindergartner slash second third grader and if it's Jackson God help you he knows how to kill people now because he's like a brown belt and it's I mean this I don't mess with the child anymore I've changed my tactics up I wait till he's asleep go take something they're playing with and what you'll discover is a nature 
that, it, that has nothing to do with Jesus. Now listen to me, because there's been a lot of parents that are like, my kids are demon possessed. No, they're not. They're not. They're not. They just need Jesus. Okay? They're operating underneath the nature they've been born into. Right? Slaves to sin. We're born into a sinful nature. Okay? Before you get like really ab- upset about that, go back and read Genesis chapter 3. It is the fall of man for which we are now born into a sinful, broken world. The importance right now of being a Christian and being in the body of Christ is to walk around underneath an open heaven, so to speak, okay, and deliver the kingdom wherever you're at. Because the kingdom that you live as an ambassador to overrides the kingdom that you live currently on the planet of. Some of you will get that later on, and I would say on your drive home, but you're probably not going to do that. So later on in the afternoon after you've had your your morning siesta, okay? Now, skip verse 9. Go back to 1 John chapter 1. We just dealt with verse 8, which means the denial of the sinful nature. I want you to skip verse 9 because that's going to be our main text this morning. Go Go to verse 10, and it's the second, it's the second heretical statement John has to deal with from the false prophets. And what he says is this, it's the first one is I'm not a sinner, the second one is I haven't sinned, which sounds a lot like it, but they're different, here's why. Verse 8 is the denial of our sinful nature. Verse 10 is the denial of our sinful actions. 1 Kings chapter 8 verse 46 don't turn there. I'm just going to read you the part that I want you to read because there's a whole, there's a lot of stuff going on in 1 Kings chapter 8 we're not going to go into today. It says, when they sin against you, comma, or dash, for there is no one who does not sin. Right? 1 John 1.8 deals with the denial of our sinful nature. 1 John 1.10 deals with the denial of our sinful actions. One is a nature we're born with. One is an action or actions we continue to live in. And the, her- the heresy that John was confronting is not so much, it's not so far from the church today. It's like as if what John was confronting then, Jesus knew we'd still be confronting And it's the belief that I haven't sinned or I haven't done anything right. Now you go, well, I don't hear people blatantly say that. Oh, but you do. It's just called subjective moral reasoning. You're like, wait a minute. I've heard of that. Okay, right. It says do whatever feels good to you because whatever feels good to you must be right. The problem with subjective moral reasoning is what if murder feels good to me? Because if what feels good to me is right, then I have the right to murder and it's not a sin. If your head hurts, just take a sip of coffee, okay? Give yourself about three seconds. Two, three, okay. What we call verse 10 is really disguised as subjective moral reasoning, which means I'm not capable of sin because I'm only doing what's right for me. That we've heard. That is mainstream, baby, let me tell you, because it's one of the biggest objections right now with Christianity in the church. I will, you can't tell me how to live. Stop. If you said yes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, your rights, my rights, died. Right there. Died. Done. Now what do we do? Well, all of us have dual citizenship, meaning I'm a citizen of heaven and, we're, and you're also a citizen of whatever country, hopefully, whatever country you're living in. Amen. Okay? The citizenship of heaven trumps, no pun intended, trumps the citizenship of, of where I'm currently living at. Which means I'm a, kingdom of, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven first, then I'm a citizen of the United States second. Okay. That's, that's, high, that's called higher kingdom living. Right? So just because the United States or another country might say that it's legal, what does heaven say? You with me? Okay, let me me take on a big one. 
All right, here we go. 19, I believe it was 72, an irreversible decision of Roe versus Wade made, made abortion legal in the nation of the United States. Now hear my heart. I know there are ladies within the sound of my voice, and some of you have had an abortion. I'm not judging you. Neither is the Lord. Neither is the Lord. The Bible's very clear about what, what happens to a nation that legalizes or says it's okay to kill babies, whether born or unborn. If you don't believe me, go look up the god Molech in Scripture, M-O-L-E-C-H. He was a god that was worshipped by the, the, the country of the ites that surrounded Israel in the Old Testament, right? The god of Molech was, had, god, had arms like this and had a big open belly. And sometimes in their worship, they would put newborn babies inside the belly, which was just full of fire, or as it was, it was a brass altar, and so those arms would be scalding, and they would place the baby on top of the arms. Either way, the baby didn't live. And it was a sacrifice that the, the ites made worshiping the bales of Peor and the bales and the Asherah poles. They would offer their firstborn children to this, to this God in a sacrificial way that would kill the baby in order that they might have first fruit crops, in order that they might have a blessing pronounced by that God over their agriculture. I'm not here to judge you. I'm not. My heart is, man, I don't know what circumstance or what situation you were in. My God loves you and looks beyond the event of the sin. And, and really, to be honest with you, totally understands the situation and the circumstances that, that whatever decision got made got made. Those don't escape the Lord. It doesn't justify what we've done. Amen? Doesn't justify it. But he is so quick and gracious and in mercy. He's so quick to love. He is so quick to forgive. He is so quick to, 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 to give grace and mercy in any short... Before everybody gets upset, let me just tell you something. In Jesus, in, in Matthew, Jesus says, it is the same when you call someone fool you've committed the same sin as murder so before everybody gets on their high horse let's all recognize let's all recognize all of us have fallen short first kings chapter chapter 4 excuse me first kings chapter 8 verse 46 is true all of us have sinned for it is impossible that not one of us should sin amen Okay. By the way, I'm going on record. Abortion's wrong. If there's any other way, Lord, let it be. If you're within the sound of my voice and you're contemplating that thing, you need to private message us immediately. Okay? We love you. There are resources out there that the church, in not just 970 Church, but any church, Within the Grand Valley, there are resources that will connect. And to be honest with you, if you'll consider adoption, I know some families in 970 Church that would be glad to welcome another baby in there. So we love you. We just want to give that side note so we can bundle that package up and keep moving forward. Amen? All right. We got to focus on verse 9. And verse 9, let me remind you, sits between verse 8 and verse 10. Okay? If we confess our sin, comma, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Right? There's a fourfold purpose of confession. And the word confession, or the word to confess, okay, this whole concept of confession has gotten a bad rap, yet in it of itself, it is a direct work, okay, of being a Christian. Now, when last week, many people um, gave their lives to the Lord or rededicated their lives to the Lord, which is awesome, all right? But when we say, you, you have what we call, the, like the real simple, easy way to understand this is ABC. Accept, believe, confess. Now, most people attach to the, 
to the thought that I'm to confess my sin. And that's actually not what Scripture says. It says, except believe that, um, that God raised him from the dead of three days and confess what? Jesus as Lord. Not confess every sin you've ever done, all that you can possibly think or imagine right then and there. And I know as a kid, I grew up in the church, and that was exactly what that word confess meant. It meant confess all that you've done wrong, ask God to forgive you, okay, and then he'll move right into your heart. All right, let us get away from the elementary teachings for just a second, okay? First of all, Jesus doesn't dwell in your heart. That's the place where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell. And if you're talking about biblical maturity, you are now marked by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. There is another, there is a second experience to be filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Can you be saved without being baptized? Yes, you can. Totally not. not, Don't even worry about it. You find in the book of Acts all the time that believers had, had, they had, what had happened was, They came in, they got saved, they said yes to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, which means they confessed Jesus as Lord now over their life, and then John, Peter, Paul, one of the apostles would come through, and they would go, hey, have you guys received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And they go, uh, what's that? And he goes, oh, happy day. Let me pray for you, and you're going to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, okay? So salvation and, and baptism, okay, and confession, they're all part of our walk with Jesus. Remember, if we're going to walk as Jesus walked, right, that's the goal, okay, then we've got to be intentional, okay, with doing that, because it doesn't necessarily just happen naturally. It's, in other words, it's like this. You've been walking now facing left, Christ is Lord, so now I'm going to walk facing right. You're learning a new way to walk. And, and it's not, it, it has to, you got to understand something. Walking like Christ is purposeful and strategic. It is intentional. You do it intentionally. You do not do it necessarily by accident. Amen. So confession is no longer necessarily a part of our salvation experience so much as confession is a necessity in our discipleship or our sanctification if you need like word today, toilet paper, okay? Sanctification is the continual walk or growth in our relationship with Christ. So for, for us, confessing Him as Lord is where it started, but now confessing anything where I've, or any place where I've missed the mark is me continually growing in my relationship with Him. And, and confession has a fourfold purpose, okay? The first one is this, we are agreeing with God that our sin is truly sin. Amen. We're agreeing with God that our sin is truly sin. In other words, we are removing the excuses and the justification behind our thoughts, feelings, and actions and saying, God, this is sin and I know better. I'm confessing this thing to you because it is veiling my face from yours. Amen. Okay? This is where I'm going to tell you again, sin is an event. It's not an identity. Sin is an event. Sometimes we have several events back to back <laughs> and didn't even realize it. Okay? But it's not an identity. You are, listen, the Bible says, according to Scripture, You are an heir of God, a co-heir with Christ, therefore making us sons and daughters. That's our identity. Is it possible for sons and daughters to still miss the mark? Yes. I don't, maybe, everyone who struggles with road rage right now, you're probably not, you're probably not wrestling with road rage as much as you were, okay? (laughs) Right? But there are several, there are several of you who, who you passionately disagree with certain leadership calls coming down from maybe, let's say, a governor's office or a presidential office or some other office of government that you may not appreciate. Eh, Stop. Hold on. Stop. Listen to me. He is your president whether you voted for him or not. And and let let me be honest with you. 
The previous president was also your president, whether you voted for him or not, going all the way back to 1992. Amen. Okay, so my first question, did you pray for your president? We ain't my president. That Then no, you didn't. <laughs> right? Now let me give you the other hidden Christianity thing, because we like to do this a lot too. Well, we just need to pray them out. <laughs> Look at my face right now. My lips are going to start to melt in a second. Praise the Lord, you're not anywhere near me that I've heard you say that, because that's manipulation and rebellion. Stop it. The Bible doesn't say you pray them out. The Bible says you lift them up. Amen. End of story. Amen. There's going to be leaders that you disagree with, right? And we just, we just wrapped up our series undercover, and then we moved immediately into the bait of Satan. Maybe some of the leaders that we disagree with hurt us, and maybe they don't even know it. Okay? I'm just going to tell you, as a leader, not, we don't know everything. We, we might come off that we do, but really we don't. Right? Amen. Now, I'll be honest with you, and I'll tell you right now, I don't know everything. I don't have any idea how this, is, this current situation called the pandemic or COVID-19 is going to full, fully change the way the earth, the world, and the church responds. What I know from Scripture and time with the Lord in His presence is this, and I shared it with the worship team this morning, this is a growing pain. This is a birth, excuse me, this is a birthing pain. Meaning, as every expectant mommy who's ever delivered a child will tell you, right, they grow in frequency and intensity as it comes time. What Jesus talks about specifically in, in birthing pain scripture is the end of the days and his return, praise the Lord. Come on. We, listen, we are not living in the light of his kingdom returning. We're living in the light of our current comfort. Stop it. Stop. Stop. All of us. I'll get a mirror. Stop. Stop. Okay? This thing right now, how we respond as Big C Church, Body of Christ, online, and as we are able to meet together in a, in, I'll just say it like this, in a in a tighter proximity, maybe we're unified underneath the same building again. What if we don't? We're still the church. We're still worshiping Jesus. He still died on the cross. One time was good enough. Live from the finished work. Grow in my relationship with him. Agree that what he calls sin is sin. End of story. If my attitude is wrong and the Holy Spirit comes and checks me about a leader or about an opinion that I might have, or maybe I picked it up. Maybe it was from a reliable source even. I want to so get into fake news and media outlets, but I'm not. I just pray, pray for me, right? Maybe I've picked up an attitude or an action that in the moment seems right or reasonable, but it's wrong. And the Holy Spirit says, hey, son, that's wrong. Hey, what you said there, that was really harsh and that was wrong. You're right. I missed the mark. I need to ask your forgiveness. Confession's first <clears throat> purpose is, is that we are agreeing with God that what we thought or what we did or how we felt was a sin. Okay? Knowing and understanding that sin is an event, it's not our identity. Number two, or the second purpose of confession is we are agreeing with God, we are turning from it. What? Turning from the sin. It's the word to repent. And if you notice, the, word, the words confess and repent are oftentimes coupled together and they go hand in glove. It is, enough, it is not enough to just confess. We also have to decide to repent. And to repent in its truest definition uh, comes from the thing of like making a 180 degree turn and, or turning your back on that behavior, that thought, that feeling, that action, and going in the opposite direction. That's what to confess and to repent means. So, or excuse me, to repent means the second full purpose of confession is we are agreeing with God, we are turning from it, or we are repenting 
from that thing that we are confessing. Sometimes I need to take Jesus back to that place where that sin is, is really be coming from. Sometimes I need to take Christ, I need to ask him, why does that, why do I think that way when this happens? When I hear this, why does it cause Wah! like this internal massive eruption of emotion and feeling that does not glorify Christ? Right? I need to listen, I need in my maturity, I need to realize, okay, that's a place I need to go ask Jesus, what's going on here? Right? Because a lot of times what we're confessing and repenting of is a symptom of what the actual root problem is. And the only way to get back to the root is ask Jesus to grab the Holy Spirit roto rooter and go back there and figure that thing out. And really, he already knows. So it's not like Jesus goes, hmm, you know, I don't know. Let's go find out. He doesn't do that. If you ask him where that thing's rooted in, oh, he'll tell you, right? I would suggest sitting down, putting a seatbelt on, making sure you have a big box of full Kleenex tissue. Because toilet paper be somehow became a commodity in like the last month. So bury that in the backyard because it's apparently worth more than gold. <laughs> right? Okay, that's your brevity for the moment. Okay? We are agreeing. The second full purpose of confession is that we are agreeing with God we are turning from sin. The third purpose of confession. We are ensuring we don't conceal our sins and so deceive ourselves. Oh, man. This one, man, when I was studying this, when I was getting ready for this, I didn't want to write this down. I didn't. And it's not because, it's not, listen to me. It's not because I don't want you to have the truth. It's because I know that some people, the truth makes them walk away. They have, people have a hard time, myself included. Nobody ever wants to be wrong. And sometimes the worst thing that you can hear from the Lord is, you're wrong. Uh, but, and we go, but, and we recite, I, and I, I'm going to say it like this, we recite the excuse and the justification and they're correct. There are times, listen to me, there are times when our excuses, they are truth. The excuse is truth, but it's still an excuse. There are times where we seem justified in our own eyes based on the behavior or actions of another human being. We're, we're allowed, this, this is right and reasonable for me to respond this way. And, and here's the hard part about this statement, okay? Don't let sin against you cause sin within you. Amen. You're writing amen right now in the feed. Don't let sin against you cause sin within you. Oh boy. Don't let sin against you cause sin within you. Write that down. Write it on your arm. Get it tattooed right here. Okay? Don't let sin against you cause sin within you. Now, you, before you, you're, you're struggling right now, you're, you've, I see it. Okay? So am I. And we would do well to remember Jesus never had a moment carrying the cross on the way to Calgary, Calvary. What do I mean by that? I, I mean, Jesus never dropped the cross on purpose, stood there, and said, do you see how they treat me? <laughs> oh. But I don't know. Last week we talked about what that would have entailed for him at that moment. Right? He's in literally like the last 80% of the journey, seeing it through to the end. But he doesn't drop the cross on purpose Okay, put his clothes back on, grab his ball, and go home. Granted, if there's one human being at that moment 
in any moment ever in human history to behave that way. It should have been, he, Jesus was certainly justified and said, you know what? You've rejected me. You hate me. You're going to kill me. I'm out. You're on your own. And it had been a bad day. Everybody, everywhere, throughout all time, bad day. But Jesus never let sin against him cause sin within him. So much so, I brought this up last night, that one of the statements that he made from the cross, after having been beaten, his hair pulled out, plucked out by the beard, I mean, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 52 that he was beaten beyond the recognition of being a man. That's a beating. That he uttered the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I mean, you talk about having your heart in the right place, purified before the Lord, Right? We, but the third purpose of confession is that we are ensuring that we do not conceal our sin and so deceive ourselves. One of the biggest things that's plaguing the church, big C church, little C church, regional church, all of the above, is that we, are, we have lost we have lost the ability to, to confess sin that would set us free. In other words, I'll confess my sin, but I was right. And, I, and now, listen, now there's not just a veil that's separating me from the Lord. The veil has a name, and that veil's name is deception. And that is one of the hardest things to minister freedom to is the veil of deception. Because what has to happen is truth from the Word of God has to pierce that veil. If, if, I, if you would, you will find this analogy used in Scripture that we have been given because of our sin, our, our hard heart or our stony heart has become hardened and we no longer feel the prick or the uh of conviction, which leads us towards confession and repentance. And one of the things that you see take place through all out the Old Testament and the New Testament is, is God constantly saying, I will tear out the heart of stone and I will give them a heart of flesh. I will give them a heart to feel what I feel. I will give them a capacity and understanding to know now what I know and see what I see and think how I think. Man, that's good stuff. All because of our relationship with God and even the indwelling and fulfillment of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Here we go, number four, and I'm going to ask Don to come up and start to, to be, play behind us and close us out. And Don, if you would ever so lovely, if you can pull it up, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Number four is this. Our fourth purpose is we are agreeing with God only the blood of Jesus sets us free from sin. I'm going to read these four again to you so that everybody has them. Number one, we're agreeing with God that our sin truly is sin. We are agreeing with God. Number two, we are agreeing with God that we are turning from sin. Number three, we are ensuring that we don't conceal our sin and so deceive ourselves. Number four, the fourth purpose of confession we are agreeing with God, only the blood of Jesus sets us free. As I say that, I'm going to read some of the rest of, 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 our, of our scripture today. The only way for us really to understand, am I deceived, have I so deceived myself, is to get into that assessment process by way of getting in a quiet place, getting alone, getting by yourself, okay, and asking yourself the hard question, Lord, am I deceived? Have I, de have I so deceived myself because maybe I've been hurt? Have I so deceived myself because maybe this has happened or maybe this has happened or maybe this has happened? And you've, you've got, listen to me, with the sound of my voice, if you're hearing it right now, you've got to get alone with God and ask yourself that hard question. Okay, it's a hard question every morning that, that Kate and I face. And sometimes we do it together. Sometimes I'll go to her and I'll say, honey, do I have this right? Am I right? 
Sometimes I will ask my staff, guys, do I have this right? Am I seeing this correctly? And they have the ability and the freedom to say, you're seeing it correctly, but Pastor John, you're seeing it from a lens of hurt, or you're seeing it from a lens of this person's past, or you're seeing it from a lens of you don't trust them. And so, no, okay, Kate will look at me and she'll go, you have the right, yes, but you're seeing the sin as an identity of who the person is and not an event that took place in their life. <sighs> yeah. Man, that is so good. And my question to you this morning is this. How's your walk? Listen, how's your walk? Let me, let me read the rest of this to you as you contemplate that question. Chapter 2, verse 1, John says this, My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Meaning, in our saint, in the growing process of our relationship with Christ, it is possible for us to grow into a place where we no longer struggle. Hallelujah. Man, that, listen to me, to be totally and completely free from sin, that's some of the best news we've ever heard. Amen. But, If anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Verse 2, chapter 2, verse 2. He, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but but also for the sins of the whole world. There is only one atoning sacrifice for There is only one who shed blood can set us free from the law of sin and death. And his name is Jesus. And we talked about him last week. And I told you I wanted to give you a moment, an opportunity this morning. You haven't yet called Jesus Lord. And listen to me. Without his lordship and leadership over your life, you are a subject, you are a slave to sin. You are a bondage. The Bible says that you you are literally, you are in chains to something that will kill you. It will kill us. And the only way for us to be set free and to go on in life, set free in this life and set free eternally is through the blood, the shed blood of Jesus Christ, who became the atoning or the substitutionary sacrifice for you and me. See, when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die for his sin because he was sinless. When he died on the cross, he died for the sins of the entire world, ever, everyone, ever, at all. And the Bible says that whosoever would believe that he did that, they would be, they would live eternal life, set free from the bonds of sin, period. Romans chapter 6, I would encourage you to read it. We got a new life, a new nature, a a new view. It's It's incredible what he did. I want to tell you something right now because there are believers within the sound of my voice that yes, we still struggle. We struggle with what we call habitual sin. In other words, that sin has become a habit. And here's the thing. If that sin is a habit, it's coming from a place we have yet to see God heal. Amen. And our, our job this morning is to say, Father, what place inside of me is not healed and that you died for to heal and to set me free from this thought or this feeling or this action. Why am I always thinking or behaving or seeing through this lens when it comes to this particular person or subject or whatever it may be? Finally, we need to understand something and this goes back to the the second thing is that sin is an event. And the, 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 listen to me, there's been a huge misunderstanding that sin is an event means it's who you are. And if you're living in the light underneath the shed blood of Jesus Christ, you're a son and a daughter of the King. And here's the deal, right? We are called to now a higher standard of living. And grace and righteousness empower us and give us the ability to live up to what Jesus has called us to. See, sin sometimes can not just mean falling short, it means settling for second best. Come on. 
it, it means instead of going after everything God gave us, we stop short and we settle for where we know we can, we can stay, we can attain, we can achieve. And here's the deal. You've, listen, you've already fallen short because you thought you could do it on your own. I want you to bow your heads with me right now and I want you to close your eyes. If you're within the sound of my voice, you should just, just listen to me for the next few minutes. You know, you know, I don't need to tell you what is and isn't a sin because you already know because there's a conviction that's taking place by the Holy Spirit right now. And, and you have the opportunity to do something different with it. You see, in the past, you've heard confession and repentance and different things explained. And you, you excused to do the same thing. And we justify. That we don't quite need to live differently. Though we know. We know from his word. Listen to me. We know from his word. We know from the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He's called us to something better, but we're settling for what we have right in front of us. There comes a point in time in every believer's life where you, you must make the decision to grow inside your relationship with Christ. If you don't believe me, there's a parable in Luke where the gardener comes and he sees a tree that has leaves and it's in his garden, but there's no fruit on the tree. And the steward of that particular garden looks at the chief gardener and he says, let, let me dung it. In your New King James Version, it says, let me dung it. In other words, let me fertilize and cause it to grow by, so, by quote unquote, piling it high and deep. I'll put the pressure on it and I'll force it to produce fruit and if after a season it still hasn't produced fruit then take it out you go that's not in your Bible I challenge you to look it up it's in Luke it's a parable it's, it's one of the few parables in Luke it's one of the exclusive parables in Luke that that only Luke has in his gospel there are some of you in that within the sound of my voice you've called yourselves believers but you have not borne any fruit because you are not intentionally trying to walk as Jesus walked. And you're finding yourself right now, there's a conviction, there's a pinprick, there's a stabbing that's taking place inside your heart by the Holy Spirit, and He is trying to draw your attention so that we will respond differently. Let me tell you something, before you, before you just shrug it off and deal with it as normal, that doesn't apply to me, thank you, Pastor, but stop it. I was in the same place two and a half, three years ago. I was sitting, I was sitting on my couch and I wanted more of God. I wanted more of what He says will happen in His Word for those that follow Him. And I, I will never forget His presence so filled my living room and the conviction of the Holy Spirit came on me and says, then stop settling because if you want more, then it will cost more of you. And truthfully, every believer within the sound of my voice, if you want more of God, it's going to cost us more. Amen. It will cost us more of ourselves. It will cost us more sleep. It might even cost us more money. Like, if it's a core value, I want you to understand something. If God is a value in your life, it's going to cost you something. My prayer for you this morning is simply this. Father, with everyone within the sound of my voice, whether we call ourselves a believer, whether we've been saved for 90 years, Lord Jesus, whether we've been saved for 24 hours or a week, it doesn't matter. We are called to grow in you. Part of our growth is to, is to confess where we've missed the mark, to repent, to live in the light of truth and not underneath the veil of deception. 
to not let sin against us cause sin within us so that we may grow and mature in our relationship with you. Every believer this morning within the sound of my voice, Father, I pray right now that there would be such a hunger for more of you that would just begin to overtake them. Lord, it would begin to fill them up. Father, for those believers this morning, they are responding differently to the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It's no longer a veil of deception. It is a, Father, I come before you right now. Here's, Here's that practical step I talked about at the beginning. I thank you for fathering me into the truth of your salvation. I thank you for guiding me and leading me through confession and repentance to the truth of your word. I thank you, Father, for fathering me and guiding me, leading me once again into the truth of your salvation, of what you have for me. My identity is not in the sin, but it is as a son or a daughter. I confess right now my sin to you and I stand on your word where it says that you are faithful and just to forgive me of my sin and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Which simply means if my unrighteousness is gone and he sees me through the light of his son, then Jesus' righteousness is standing there before him. And that's, that's part of your identity and your inheritance through the lordship of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for the sanctifying work that is taking place all across this building with the few that are here, everyone within the sound of my voice that is watching online. We choose to grow intentionally in our faith in you, and we do that, Father, by confessing where we've missed it, where we we confess right now where we've been deceived. And I pray, Father, that by the, the love and life of your Holy Spirit, you remove that veil of deception in the name of Jesus. We choose consciously right now to believe the truth and to walk in the truth as your son Jesus modeled it. We turn our eyes upon Jesus and we look full into his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. The blood of Jesus is speaking better things. Father, I thank You for this church and for this word that You brought. Jesus, I pray right now that by Your Holy Spirit You would seal it upon our hearts that we would never leave here the same again that we would never watch a service the same way again because of how you've changed us. We love you, Lord. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In your name we pray, amen. Well, man, we're at the end of service, and we're so glad that you joined us this morning. And we pray right now that, uh, really, we pray right now that people start going back to work in the name of Jesus, that we have favor with the governor here in Colorado and that he starts opening things back up. Uh, here in in uh, in a county and, and all across the world, I do want to I want to mention one thing. Make sure that you do join us and Pastor Steve on Tuesday mornings on Facebook Live 6:30 a.m. Um, and you make plans to join us on Wednesday night and Thursday night for those different studies. If you have a student or a, a, a child that's involved in kids and student ministries, those Facebook links will be up. You should be able to see those videos at some point in time today and this afternoon. We love you, we bless you right now in the name of Jesus, that the path in front of you would be straight, that it would that would have come up, that the valley would come up, that the mountain would be made low, that it would be a stable path, that the Lord would come before you, come alongside you, come behind you and be your rear guard and bless you in the name of Jesus, we pray this morning. Amen. We love you. We'll see you, uh, we'll see you hopefully Wednesday night.